Now, last year, private real estate absolutely smoked publicly traded real estate. It, it might be the biggest delta of any year uh, since we've been keeping records. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the Vanguard REIT fund was down 23 or 25% or something like that on the year, uh, while just about every private real estate investment I had last year had a positive return. What does that mean going forward? Should we expect the pendulum to swing back a little bit? Or, or what do you see in your crystal ball? That's a great question. It's it's one that uh, probably could spend a whole whole lot of time on. But I'll say, you know, two two things that, that I, I I would say in relation to that. One is, you know, the public market, you know, real estate funds, which, you know, there's a lot more of real estate that's tied to public markets than I think most people realize. Um, and so a lot of real estate is owned in the public markets and even more percentage of the debt comes from public markets than I think people people realize. And that's why there's such a lack of liquidity that I talked about a moment ago. Um, but so much of the value of your public real estate investment um, is tied to, to volatility, not just of the real estate, but even more so to the sentiment or the fear around real estate. And, and uh, you know, we're seeing it right now today. And some of the, in my opinion, some of the strongest, best banks in the in the country have seen their value of their stock go down by 50%. Did the, did the actual value of that bank decrease by 50%? Did some, you know, did, did their cash flow or income drop by 50%? No. Um, um, and, and so I think you'll see those, those swings both in the negative and in the increase um, of assets trading above tangible book value or significantly right now today below tangible book value, the actual value of the real estate uh, significantly. So for us, all that matters is the actual tangible value of the real estate, um, not the, the uh, perception of it or the fear related to it or the volatility around the direction of it. Um, so I think, I think that's important to, to note. So there's a lot less volatility in the private markets. Um, but I think the bigger thing to think about, so I love, you know, the Blackstones of the world. I love uh, a lot of, you know, the Fortress and a lot of these great, uh, these big public uh, private equity firms or public companies and private equity firms that are sometimes two, one and the same really. But these big companies in that I love to sell properties to them. I love to buy from them um, when they're, uh, uh, you know, changing directions. And I love to borrow from them. Um, or sell them loans. So example, some of the groups I mentioned and some I didn't mention that, you know, are some of the biggest group that we've sold 30 year mortgages to that we've uh, originated that we don't want to keep on our balance sheet because we don't want four or 5% loans in our balance sheet. And we were selling them to these guys, right? Uh, we've sold assets to them. We'll, we'll do all the hard work to get a property performing really well and sell to them at a really incredible price. Um, and, uh, so I think they're, they're great and that they, uh, they have big money to deploy. They have cheap capital to deploy and so they can be great to borrow from, great to sell from, and sometimes great to buy from. Um, but what they're generally not is great operators. So, you know, generally speaking, they, um, don't have the ability to operate and do the, do the heavy lift that, that, uh, operators like us would do. And then in addition, they generally have, uh, as I mentioned before, in the benefits of private funds, significant commissions and regulatory costs and so forth that eat away from the cost. So um, when when a nice property that's fully performing uh, gets put out there with the Cushman Wakefields of the, field, of the world, these big public groups will pay, generally speaking, 5, 10, 15, 20 percent higher than than a group like DLP can pay. And then they add on top of that layers of additional expenses and compliance and commissions. When you have when you're paying higher prices. Uh, and you're having significantly higher, you know, compliance, regulatory, and commission costs. There's, it's not possible, in my opinion, to generate as strong of returns as you know groups like DLP are able to generate. Um, just the, the, there's not enough, you know, meat there to go around when you're paying higher prices with with uh, significantly higher costs. So, um, so I think those are some of the factors when you look over time why the public funds are going to generally underperform the best private operators. And I think they can get away from writing down their assets by 20% in a quarter and then showing the next five years that it just goes up. Well, they wrote off 20% or 30% in one quarter, right? And, and marked everything down and said, oops, you know, what, what can we do? Um, and uh, you see that if you look back over history time and time again, uh, my investors would not be okay if I marked down my assets 20% and said, let's just start from scratch here again, right? And um, and, and let's, for, let's forget that one quarter. Um, so... Uh, it's it's a very interesting dichotomy between the private markets and public markets, especially when it comes to, you know, asset classes like multifamily. 
The hosts of the White Coat Investor podcast are not licensed accountants, attorneys, or financial advisors. This podcast is free entertainment and information only. It should not be considered professional or personalized financial advice. You should consult the appropriate professional for specific advice relating to your situation.